than you ever imagined. Hello from the Aquarium of the Pacific. My name is Frankie and I'm an aviculturist with our Magellanic Penguins. And today I have Jade here. Jade is six years old and one of our shyer and quieter birds and she's made it up with Skipper. Jade and Skipper are both chicks that hatched here at the Aquarium of the Pacific and they both are offspring of Brazilian rescues, Kate, Avery, and Roxy. All three of those birds were found with Robbie off the coast of northern Brazil, several thousand miles outside of their normal range. Right now, these penguins are in their migration season, and it's most likely that when those three birds were stranded, they were also in their migration season, where they were following a food source, and for them, they just got a little bit too far out of range, where right now our birds are swimming in the water, looking for a food source, and naturally we'll be done with that in about three to four months. That's a little bit about Jade and the rest of her colony here in our June Keys penguin habitat. Thanks for tuning in. Goodbye from the aquarium. Hello and welcome to the Zoo Berlin. My name is Katharina and I'm a part of the species conservation team here at Zoo Berlin. Uh, I'm standing here right in front of a zoo, which is located uh, just in the city center of Berlin, of our capital of Germany. And the Zoo Berlin is not only the oldest zoo in G Germany, it is in fact the most species-rich zoo worldwide. And I would like to take you on a little tour through our zoo. Let me just quickly flip the camera. you enjoyed our little tour, our little spontaneous tour around the zoo and um, we are hoping to welcome you all at Zoo Berlin one day and until then have a good day and stay healthy. Bye. That was awesome. Okay. Welcome to today's TEA Digital everybody. My name is Erica and I'm the Director of Operations for TEA. Hi. Uh, and today I'm going to be your technical producer. Uh, we are so happy that all of you could join us. Before we get started, a few things. Please change your name to first and last name, and then your company, or your type of membership, or your favorite animal, something cool. Um, and that's pretty much the only thing I have for you, except for we will be doing this particular event in a couple different pieces, which our moderator will explain. And with that, I would like to introduce you all to Justin Stucy of the Western Division Board. Hi, Justin. Good morning, y'all. Good afternoon. Max, I know you're watch watching in Berlin. Good evening. Um, hello, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. And thank you, Frankie and Catherine, for giving us a peek into your world. Uh, so just to kind of give you all an, an idea of how things are gonna, gonna shake down, um, Lacey Campbell is gonna be joining us a little later to lead um, the breakout group um, uh, to chat with panelists. So you're welcome to stick around if you wanna, if you wanna network a bit or log off if you have to run and go do something else. The next half hour will be filled with exploring passionate work of four individual talented human beings. I ask that if you feel contrary to our discussion, please hold any negative comments for a different form. These people have committed their lives to helping animals and they deserve the utmost respect for doing so. All right, now please help me welcome our first panelist. 
and feel free to use a clap emoji. Erin Clark considers herself one of the luckiest people around because she has been able to spend her career caring for animals. As director of animal projects for Zoo Oceanarium Group, Erin works with a dedicated team of operations and animal care professionals, designers, contractors, and project owners to create immersive and engaging experiences and emerging and engaging experiences for animals and people alike. Please help me welcome Erin Clark. Next, we have Dwayne Hills. He's education manager at Mississippi Aquarium. By way of California, he brought extensive experience in animal husbandry, education, social work, and management. He oversees all educational programming, professional development, and instructional content at Mississippi Aquarium. Please help me welcome Dwayne Hills. Dwayne! Next, we have Dr. Haley Weston Murphy. She's a graduate of Cornell University College of Veterinary Medicine and is currently Deputy Director of Zoo Atlanta. She is a recent graduate of the Executive Leadership Development Program of the Asso Association of Zoos and Aquariums, AZA. She is also the founder and director of the Great Ape Heart Project. Please help me welcome Dr. Haley Weston Murphy. And last but not least, we have Patrick Phelan, Senior Director of Guest Experiences at Denver Zoo. Started as a volunteer in the Animal Ambassador Department. After he rediscovered his passion for wildlife conservation and education, it inspired him to leave a career in retail and advertising to become a lifelong zoo and aquarium professional. During his more than 20 years of service at Denver Zoo, he has held leadership positions and guest services, attractions, marketing events, and more. Please help me welcome Patrick Phelan. It's kind of weird, like not being able to actually hear anything, but I know y'all are, are clapping. All right, so panelists, um, feel free to unmute. How's everybody doing? Good, how are you? Pretty good, pretty good. good. Thanks, thanks for coming out this morning. Thanks for, thanks for meeting up this morning. Um, so I think before we get in too far, some congratulations are in order. Um, Aaron, uh, St. Louis Aquarium, uh, recipients of the Thea Award for Outstanding Achievement, entrance experience. Can you share a little bit about what guests experience when they enter uh, St. Louis Aquarium? Absolutely, and thank you. We're um, still very excited about it and almost can't believe it ourselves. Um, so. The St. Louis Aquarium is located in a historic train station. Um, Union Station helped create the city of St. Louis as we know it today. Um, and so it was really important for us to honor that history when building the aquarium. Um, and it was an excellent, you know, kind of design art. Um, architect firm PJV was tasked with trying to meld an aquarium and a train station together and make the story work. Um, and so our entrance experience um, kind of takes a similar approach to what you would see in the grand lobby of Union Station, which is a projection map show. Um, but because of the lighting levels, we have 4K projection screens on the ceiling and on the wall um, in honor of our award. It's my background image here. And so we have 10 to 12 different vignettes that play on a loop. Um, so as you're waiting for this train experience, which is a three minute virtual tour of what you're going to see when you go into the aquarium, um, you get to watch this amazing overhead show. Um, it's also a lobby, so there are restrooms and you know it gives you the opportunity to kind of collect yourself before you start your experience, but it sets the tone um, for a completely different experience um, that you might see at a zoo and aquarium elsewhere. That's so cool. Well, congratulations. It is really beautiful. Um, and I, I hope I get a chance to, to see it in person one day. Um, were there any unexpected moments that came about that uh, captured your guest's attention when you when you opened this uh, this experience? Yes, yeah, so, I mean it's it's one of the first things that you see when you walk in. Um, but we've done a really nice job of hiding it. So you scan your ticket, you enter, you go through your photo experience, you turn the corner, and this is right in front of you. And so it is still my favorite. Um, definitely favorites for all of our team to stand in that lobby and watch guests come around the corner and just the look of awe on their face when there are fish swimming overhead or that's the experience we want to create the entire visit and so to be able to capture that right from the very beginning is um, fantastic for us you know and, and really what we're looking for. Totally totally um, so what, what have you all been doing to, uh, to stay connected this has been kind of a, a crazy year um you know I'm, I'm sure social media has been leveraged um yeah what, what have you all been doing to sort of stay stay relevant in the minds of your guests and audience the st louis aquarium was fortunate to um have just opened in december 
Um, so we're coming up on our one year anniversary. So I say fortunate because in order to stay connected with our guests before we even opened, um, we had developed a pretty strong online like social media presence. Um, and so we already kind of had that in our experience to be able to do. Um, so what we did when we had to close uh, in June was we started just live streaming. streaming. Um, we would do these you know, breakfast sessions a couple of times a week where we'd invite our you know, our guests to join us virtually and, and get to meet some of our animals and our team, um, you know, through their safety of their computer screen. Um, so it allowed us to continue having those conversations, even though we couldn't have them in person. That's super cool. Now, I, I do have a little something that I, I want to share with everybody. Um, and if you wouldn't mind just kind of walking us through what, what do we see here? What's going on here? So some of the fun things that we wanted to do, um, we have partner with a local rehabilitation, excuse me, rescue center. Um, and so we brought in kittens while we were closed um, and allowed them to kind of run around um, parts of the aquarium. It was great to highlight, you know, this other local and amazing organization. And it also gave our animals, as you can see, our North American river otters and even our staff some um, much deserved enrichment. We were closed for three months. This is my favorite part here. So. Our Goliath grouper very quickly woke up and I uh, discovered these kittens walking around in front of them. Very intrigued. So cute. I love it. So um, from one new aquarium to another, Dwayne, now you moved uh, your family from California to Gulfport, Mississippi, so you could help open this new aquarium, which is a pretty cool leap. Um, but this past, this past year has been a big challenge, you know, with COVID and, and the hurricane. What have been some of the things that, that the team at Mississippi Aquarium has learned through, uh, through opening through a year like this? Ooh, to be resilient and to, to roll with the punches and to change. <laughs> um, so we picked a great time um, to open. Uh, who wants to open in the middle of COVID? And then this particular year, for many of you who've been following the hurricane season, we've had a particularly busy season. Um, so several of the hurricanes came directly over the aquarium. Um, so it impacted operations. So one of the things that we've really learned is to, is to just roll with the punches and, and be resilient and to reach out uh, to community partners um, and, to, and to be open to those things. But adapting and change have been right at the forefront um, and just and making sure that you're reaching out and remembering why we're here and the purpose uh, for existing in the first place. That's beautiful. Now you have a background in social work, right? <laughs> I, do. In social work. I do. So I always joke around whenever I go and talk to various members of the community and they ask how I got into this field. I always tell them I've never had a straight line in anything that I've done. So my paths have always had like, you know, veers, shoots and things of that nature. So um, I started my career at the Jacksonville Zoo almost some 20 years ago um, when I was still in high school. And then from there, I rolled into um, the education department, uh, did a brief stint in the, as, a, as a zookeeper, uh, working as a swing keeper there. And so that's how it all kind of started. And so somewhere down the road, I ventured into social work. Um, and so, and then now I've gotten to a point where I ventured back to my first passion, I'd like to say. Um, and so when people say, well, how do you have all of these things um, that are seemingly unrelated? And then I push back a little bit and I say, they're actually related in so much. So what I'm most passionate about is conservation education. And so in order to impact change, in order to increase conservation behavior, you have to know something about human behavior in order to increase the conservation behavior among the guests and the public that we serve. So I draw heavily on my social work background. I draw heavily on my education background. I draw heavily on my animal care experience as well. And so it all ties in together. So what seems as different little little pots and pockets actually are just one big pot. And, and I think I'm a, I'm a very interesting resource because I just pull it all together um, to, to serve the public that we, that we want to reach out, <clears throat> excuse me, to. Super cool, super cool. So if, if you could part us a little inside peek, what are, what are you working on for 2021? 
2021, one, what we're trying to do, we just opened. Um, and so August, we just had our grand um, opening. So what we've really been doing is we've actually kind of had to shift our operations. So the traditional way of doing zoo education, aquarium education, we've had to change obviously like many other institutions where we went online, we had to reach out into the community and just kind of change, adapt and so forth and to make sure that we're meeting the needs. So a lot of work, what we were doing, we were planning to roll out upon opening a robust school program, our field trips, um, our outreach programs. So our outreach is still in play, but we've had to really put an emphasis on our virtual education. And so we've always had an aggressive strategy of making Mississippi Aquarium truly the people's aquarium. And so we had to reach across the state and strategize how we're going to take where we are, we're actually in the Gulf, so we're in Southern Mississippi. How do we reach the rural parts of the state all the way to the Northern parts of the state with the, the message of the aquarium? And so strategizing, reaching out, really having a robust education program. Um, so what we've done is we've developed what we call the MMU, which is the mobile marine unit. So we're retrofitting an Airstream to look like a submarine. And that's actually going to be our mobile class, one of our mobile classrooms that we're going to use to take the education message of the aquarium all throughout Mississippi. That's actually going to be equipped where we can have um, aquatic tanks on board. So some of the aquatic species such as horseshoe crabs, uh, epaulette sharks, um, even some smaller skates and rays, we can actually take out into the community with the self-contained equipment that we have on board. So that's actually in process. We're actually looking to get that going uh, in 2021. Um, on the nearer side, we actually have what we call MAC, the mobile aquatic cart. So that's kind of a smaller scaled down version of the MMU. So we can actually take sharks and other aquatic species into the community. So we've actually had several programs where we're doing shark education um, and we're just taking smaller species of sharks into the community. So those who can't come to the aquarium, we're going to come to you because we have this message of conservation that we've got to get out to the state um, and abroad. And so those are just some of the things that we're working on in the very near future in, in the beginning of 2021 um, to make sure that we're fulfilling our, our mission. When for us, it's education, it's conservation, and it's community. That's so cool. Gosh, there's, there's just been a lot of exciting things happening in, in the world of aquariums lately. Um, uh, Georgia Aquarium, of course, just opened a, a new super cool shark exhibit. It's got that cool like LED thing uh, that makes you feel like you're going in under the water. Um, I think uh, SeaWorld Abu Dhabi announced it, that they're going to be opening in, in a couple of years. So there's, there's a lot of really, really cool uh, stuff happening. Um, Aaron, um, didn't you work, work, work on a project in the Middle East? And I did. I was there for eight years. Um, the last one was in Dubai, where I, we uh, opened and operated the Green Planet, which was an indoor tropical rainforest biodome. Um, in the middle of a desert, which was just an amazing opportunity to introduce. I mean, the UAE has 70% um, of the country are expatriates, they're so not from there. Um, and so it was amazing to bring this huge cultural pot together, um, both in building and working at the facility, but also welcoming them to the um, environment and introducing them to the importance of rainforest. Um, wow. Even if you're in a desert, they're still important to you. Um, and helping to explain, you know, why. So, absolutely. Very what, what was your favorite experience there? Oh gosh, there were so many of them. I think what I loved about working at Green Planet was um, understanding how different um, groups. You know, you would have your because there's so it's such a cultural pot. You would get um, families from Southeast Asia or, or families from Europe or families from America, um, and just seeing how they all interacted with the space a little differently. Um, and so you would have to um, adapt to that and kind of on how the importance of um, showing more than talking. You know, where English is not necessarily the primary language for a lot of our guests um, when things are very um, like uh, text heavy or speech heavy messages can get lost, but you can show them a cockroach and have families from all across the world um, learn to appreciate that animal in the same, you know, same way. So. Absolutely. That's super cool. 
Dwayne, I might bounce that same question to you. What's what is your favorite exhibit at Mississippi Aquarium or or new attraction that that you all have? That's a good one. Um, ironically enough, it has it. I actually we Mississippi Aquarium is unique. We have an indoor you know component which is traditional what you see with aquariums but then we also have an outdoor component which is kind of more like a zoo feel so we're a nice hybrid so i actually like kind of the outside portion so my favorite i love we have crocodilians so we have two species of crocodilian we have the american crocodile and then we have the american alligator and i spend a lot of my time just out there interacting with guests, educating. We do a croc talk. Um, and that's where I spend a lot of my time just because I'm so fascinated um, by crocodilians. We have two um, juvenile American alligators in our animal ambassador collection that we bring out often. And we really talk about um, conservation. We talk about the story of the American crocodile and we compare it to the American alligator and really drawing those along those parallels and correlations and, and just creating that connection for many individuals. And, you know, we see alligators all the time in Mississippi, but a lot of people don't realize, oh, we have an American crocodile that's, you know, endemic to North America as well. Um, obviously diminishing portions, but, but educating that piece and really creating those connections. And then the two alligators that we have in the ambassador collection, I tell the story, how they came to the aquarium. They were born in the wild. They were confiscated by individuals who were keeping them as pets illegally. And unfortunately they could not be returned. So we talk about that story and why it's really important to protect when you see wild animals, keep distance. We don't wanna feed them. We definitely don't wanna keep them as pets because they're not pets. Um, so we make those connections and we talk about those. But I know I went on a tangent, but I just get so excited uh, just talking about that's my favorite area. So when I'm, on, when I'm on the grounds of the aquarium, you can probably find me somewhere near the crocodilian habitats. That's super cool. I love that, I love that. Now, you know, you know, the new aquariums are cool. They've got all the bells and whistles, the new, the new, the, the paint is fresh, you know, but you know, there's some older institutions that are holding it down too. Um, and now, Patrick, ha, remind me, how, how old is, is Denver Zoo? We're old, 125 <laughs> years. So uh, next year we'll celebrate our 125th year anniversary. So wow. Yeah. Wow. yeah. Uh, Dr. Haley, how, how old is Zoo Atlanta? I knew you were going to ask me that, and I'm frantically <laughs> Googling it. Um, <laughs> Educated guests. We're, we're about there too. I think we're the second or third oldest. We started in um, 1889. Wow, that is that is wild. Um, now your your zoo is home to to panda, both giant panda, cute red panda. Right. Um, I, I have a question about the giant panda. They're they're an example of um, of animals that have come off of the endangered species list. I'm curious, right. how does that actually happen? Well, they were downgraded, so um, that just means that we've had tremendous conservation success, which is. Um, unfortunately not heard of very often or as often as it should be, but really they, they um, are a species that was really on the brink of extinction. And um, a bunch of people um, got together through AZA and, and through different um, scientific organizations and really paired up with colleagues in China to try and save them. Um, giant panda biology, I always say if it wasn't for people, they wouldn't be here because they're very difficult to maintain and breed. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was a combination and I'm sure everybody on this call, at least on the panel knows that conservation's complex. So it was a, a combination of um, protecting habitat combined with scientific discovery and really, um, working intensely to learn about their biology and physiology and how to raise cubs that save the giant panda. And so now, you know, there's a network of zoos. So XC2 breeding facilities and Zoo Atlanta is one of them. There's only three zoos um, actually in the United States and Canada just sent their last giant pandas back to China. So I used to say in North America, there was four, but there's only three now in North America with giant pandas, but we all, worked very uh, intensely and still continue to work intensely together to research to save the giant panda. That's incredible work, gosh. So cool to hear the, the, good, the good news that it's kind of happening out there. Now I can't yeah. help but notice behind you, um, it, which reminds me, you know, Zoo Atlanta has one of the, uh, the most intentionally designed habitats for gorilla. 
Um, what exactly makes it so unique? Well, many years ago when the zoo, um, the zoo was really known for Willie B, which was a really famous gorilla in Atlanta. But Willie B had a sad story. He lived by himself in kind of the old, old zoo enclosures, right, with a t television and tile. Um, and so really we undertook an experiment to design habitats for gorillas that would make them be comfortable and not necessarily a zoo visitor. So we have five big gorilla habitats and they are all uphill. So the people, the visitors to the zoo and the staff are downhill from the gorillas. And we did a lot of research to research that that makes, um, that makes them feel a lot more comfortable. So they use the habitat space more. Um, we have an incredibly successful breeding program. Um, and in fact, we won a conservation award from AZA for our successful breeding of gorillas. Um, and we're able to keep them in big naturalized family groups, which really helps um, their behavior. So yeah, I, I think um, just the intentionality of studying their behavior and their needs and designing habitats that really encourage their emotional and, and physical health has made a world of difference. That's phenomenal. What do you hope guests take away from an experience with a great ape at, at Zoo Atlanta? Well, certainly we we also have a tremendous um, orangutan uh, collection of animals. I, I think that it's really um, the connection that that they're so like us and that we need to protect them and protect the environments that they come from, all animals. But certainly I think with great apes, there's just such a connection when you look in their eyes and you see what they're doing that they're, they are so closely related to us and they, they you know, have all sorts of different mannerisms and um, emotions and vocalizations that I, I've seen it myself. I've seen people who weren't really big animal fans or didn't understand conservation initiatives and they come up close to a great ape and all of a sudden they're really touched by that, um, by that emotional connection. And so that's what that's what all of us on the panel, I'm sure, are, are aiming to do, whether it's with a great ape or a zebra or a fish or a shark. Um, it's creating that connection that people really need to understand the, the con conservation things that have to happen to save those animals in the wild. That's so, that's so true. Um, you know, just, just hearing you uh, say the emotional connection when Duane mentioned um, uh, the storytelling aspect of telling the story of the animals. These are all these key pieces that really sort of clarify how uh, the zoological and aquarium uh, organizations fit within themed entertainment. You know, a lot of times people, even myself, uh, when I, before I got into in, in the industry, um, you know, I, I perhaps thought about a zoo as, as a place of entertainment, um, but uh, I, was, I was corrected that it's, it's not just entertainment or it's not for the sake of entertainment, rather. Um, but it's for the, the sake of making a, a connection between humans and animals uh, so that we can have a, a place in our hearts and our, our behavior to, to protect them and protect their habitat. So um, I, I, love, I love hearing how, how those things come together. Um, but I wanna change, change lanes just a little bit and talk about storytelling at the local level. Um, and Patrick, I'm gonna pass this one to you. Um, so you were part of the team that brought a culturally highly immersive uh, exhibit to Denver as well as a new Stingray exhibit earlier uh, this year. Is, is that right? Correct, yeah. Uh, cool. Stingray Cove, so we opened, um, well, we're slated to open March of this year and COVID, as all of us have heard from different exhibits, completely changed that. So we did open that exhibit as the zoo reopened in June. Um, and it's, we've had a process of working with the community and different cultural organizations and different cultures to really develop our not just our theming, but our stories of exhibits, because a lot of conserving animals is also a lot about people. Um, you can't really conserve animals without touching on that human element. So when we started to develop the Stingray uh, Cove exhibit, which is in no way for us a massive undertaking or a very large exhibit for us, it's a, it's a smaller scope exhibit, but we really wanted to have a cultural connection with this one um, and a connection of place and a story behind it. So. Just before COVID hit, we actually took, um, we did an application process, uh, selected a local artist and a local um, community leader here within the Hispanic um, culture here in Denver, and actually traveled down to Baja, Mexico, 
because that's kind of where we wanted to theme this exhibit. And we heard from the community that had a connection. So just before COVID, we actually traveled down to Baja to help that artist get a little inspiration and to help us design portions of that exhibit to tie back to culture as well as conservation um, with stingrays and other animals. That is so cool. I want to share a picture and just, you know, when you were talking about uh, animals and, and people and making connections, um, this picture is what came to mind when I thought, think about Patrick Phelan. <laughs> what is that? What am I even doing? <laughs> <laughs> so full, oh, squirrels full. and lights. Yeah. That's full where disclosure, right. everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Me and Patrick used to work together. I worked at, at, at Denver Zoo uh, for, for two years and, and he was my boss. And um, Zoo Lights was one of the one of the fun projects that we worked on together. Um, but in, in reality, just to kind of go back to what you were talking about with the, the, the Stingray exhibit, this was the piece um, that, that you were referring to, is that correct? That's correct, yeah, so that's a mural piece. We've done some small murals and art throughout the zoo. This for us was really stepping into a, uh, I don't know if it's a new period or a new, new project for us, but I think you're gonna see this continue as we move forward with the exhibits of actually bringing in a little bit more um, modern community art to um, our exhibits, which helps bring some of that storytelling from a community perspective and an artist perspective. So that is a mural that is by our Stingray Cove exhibit. And there's a lot of art pieces as part of the exhibit as well. That is super cool. Um, so I, I'm gonna kind of, we're, we're getting a little close on time here. Uh, I've, I've got two more questions, and uh, I guess the, the first one is going to be for, for everyone. Um, and uh, the second one, I'll just pass it to whoever wants uh, to respond to it. Uh, so with this first question, um, are there things that you all hope your guests will one day get to touch, see, do, or learn? What do you think the future of guest experience could look like? And I'd like to maybe start uh, with Dwayne on that question, just to kind of hear uh, your thoughts, and then you all feel free to just sort of jump in as you feel so inspired. Oh, oh there's so many places you can go with that one. How huh? you threw a you threw a big one. Um, basically, for me, with the whole guest experience, my aim, at least in my in what I do in my world, is trying to through guest experience create the connection. Because for me, that connection is essential. I think everyone on this panel, we're, we're tied to conservation. Um, we, we are highly passionate. We are interested in wildlife conservation. And in turn, we would like to convey that passion to the guests. And I think the best way to do that is through connection. So I can tell you about the animals. I can tell you about them. But until I make that connection, you're not likely to care about it. So people conserve, people protect what they care about. And so until we can get that, that connection and, to, and explain to them why they need to care, why they should care, um, then I think we're, we're not really doing our jobs to, to the, the full extent. And so for me, with that guest experience, is how by coming through the doors, by coming through the zoo or coming through the aquarium, how can we connect you to issues in the plight of animals in the wild? And for me, it's, it's again, tell those stories, um, make those connections. Um, we have, you know, touch habitats. So if I can tell you about an epaulet shark or a coral cat shark, but if you can actually touch one or if you can see a horseshoe crab and interact, then you're more likely to remember that, create those connections. And so when we're talking about this is how you can protect them in the wild, you're now you're more engaged. You touched on something earlier about entertainment. And I'm glad that you you kind of you know clarified that. Entertainment's great. Entertainment is passive. What we're interested in doing is not only entertaining, we want to engage. Engage requires some level of action. And so if our mission is to create and to in, increase conservation behavior, then we have to encourage people to take action. This is not just only for zoos, only for aquariums. We all have a stake in this if we want to see a future where wildlife is still around and protected. So creating those connections. Um, and so through every experience, through coming to the aquarium or coming to the zoo, we want to bring it to your front door. We want to connect you to those. So it's not just someone else's problem. It's my problem, too. Beautiful. Dr. Haley? 
Yeah, boy, I can't say much more, Dwayne. <laughs> that was very well said, very well put. Um, I, I would point out just in the unique space we're all in right now with this pandemic that I think sometimes those connections are made stronger if you point out how everyday action affects you at home. And so I think, um, you know, I've been looking at ways to, to engage people and say, we're all in this together, this global pandemic, partly because of the wildlife trade and climate change and, and all the things that made this pandemic possible, right? And so um, I think some of those connections to reach those people that might not connect as well with the animals is connect with how important the environment is to you and your family locally, regionally, and globally. And so I, I do see this pandemic as an opportunity to really bring it home to people that we've got to start taking better care of the earth um, because this will keep happening if we don't. And so just, just another, like I always say, I'm always looking for silver linings. My staff knows that I say that all the time, what's our silver lining? And so if you can find a silver lining in this pandemic, I think it's a, it's a golden opportunity for all of us that care about biodiversity and the environment to use this as an example of how it really does affect every single person living today and in future generations if we don't we don't start some of these connections happening. Erin? What are your thoughts? What do you think the future of guest experience could look like? Yeah, so um, I was saying I was I was glad I got to go third and not last. I think everybody <laughs> came up with great, great answers. Um, but just to touch upon, I think a little bit more, um, you know, what Dr. Haley was saying and, and Dwayne, it's also making sure that those connections, we're um, presenting them to everybody and recognizing that not everybody's going to experience our zoo or our aquarium in the same context. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's being sure to constantly shift your gears and, and um, using kind of all the tools that you've got, like, you know, technology is an amazing tool, but it's just one. Um, I think we've all learned, especially over these last few months, how just important that personal connection is. Um, and so making sure you're using that, um, but recognizing that each one of our guests are, are very different. Um, and so if there's a way to create a space that is appropriate for as many of them as possible, um, including those with sensory issues or um, deaf or hard of hearing or um, any number of other, you know, uh, disabilities or, you know, just unique challenges. So uh, making sure that we're not losing sight of the fact that everybody is different and focusing um, on making sure we're as accessible as possible. Patrick. Yeah, Aaron's right. It's great to go last. Um, <laughs> they all said it. Incredibly well. So um, <laughs> I think the pieces that I would say from each one of them, if I were to summarize it, um, Dwayne started with that connection um, and then really bringing it up with the action. So to me, the best thing we can do as we engage guests is going to be building that connection. And the whole goal of what we do as zoos and aquariums is to cause that action. Um, it's really what Haley brought up too of we need that action to happen to actually save this planet. And we're seeing the effects of, of not having the action we need. So it's the connection and action. And I think bringing that back into with what Aaron just brought up of individualistic, um, that's something that's been hard for us to do. And I think we're all honing that just like a lot of individuals in the entertainment industry and storytelling industry is how can you have a single goal or an action, but be able to have a meaning and a connection to each individual so they really feel that impact. Um, and that's something that I think is that, that ideal world, that gold star where we're trying to get to is that each individual that comes through our doors or that interacts with us um, online can have their own connection and find a way to really be engaged in some sort of action um, to help save the planet. And I think the final piece with that we're learning is the relationship component too. I think for a lot of years, we've sometimes forgotten that there's more than that one visit or that one interaction, that there's a pre-visit and a post-visit and a time during the visit. And that storytelling is really important, especially for action, to have a relationship. So I think as we build these connections, we're realizing the importance of 
hitting them before they come and see us and before they learn our stories, really connecting with them while they're here or while they're engaging with us, and then following up and maintaining that relationship longer term. That's something I think that COVID has really taught us as well, as we look at a silver lining for, for what we're learning. It's incredible stuff. So I've got one last question uh, from one of our TEA members, uh, from Adam Sharp, who, who's always on LinkedIn, leaving very positive and uplifting uh, notes on people's work. Uh, and, uh, and I think that he's got a great question here. And this one is about edutainment. And this is for anyone who feels like uh, they, they, they feel so inspired to answer. Um, what are important factors in creating exciting educational experiences within a zoo or aquarium? Want me to say it again? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I didn't read it so smooth, did I? Um, <laughs> what are exciting factors in creating exciting educational experiences within a zoo or aquarium? I mean, I could take a first step um, at that. I think it's, it's again, I hate to sound like a broken record, but it's, it's creating that connection. So, um, you know, if you, if you want to get people engaged, you have to get them engaged in a way that meets their needs. So whether it's an, an immersive habitat, kind of like the Georgia Aquarium just did, or I'm, I'm super excited to go see the St. Louis Aquarium because it sounds like super cool immersion opportunities, or whether it's the opportunity to do um, an encounter with an animal or see a show with an animal where you really create this kind of um, connection first to educate after you, you kind of snag them, right? I think that's the key. And that can vary by, by species you're trying to educate them about, by, by ecosystem, by experience, by their cultural background. So there's no right one right recipe. I think it's really looking at what you need to achieve. So start from the end and work backwards to develop something that, that works. Incredible. Well, thank you all so very much for taking time out of your, your busy day to, to chat. Um, I'm sure all of our viewers uh, probably really enjoyed and hopefully got something uh, new out of what you all had to share. And also, I just want to say a quick, uh, a quick thank you to a couple of, of others, Stephen Young with Visual Terrain, Melissa uh, Rumino with Nassel, Christian Brand with Myco2, Sam Lieberstein with Indie Marketing. All these individuals helped to make this possible. Thank you all so much for your help on this. So now we're gonna change gears a little bit and get into some group discussion and networking. If you, if, if, uh, you all wanna stick around uh, with that, we're gonna invite Lacey Campbell in um, to uh, lead us on that segment. One last kind of like snaps for our, uh, for our panelists there. Let's see here. All right, Erica, I'm gonna need you to help me because you know me and the Zoom thing is a little questionable. I'll just start talking and yeah, see if that helps. Great. <laughs> great. Yeah, I mean, I really cannot say it enough. We appreciate your time so much, um, panelists. This has just been such a great discussion and I'm watching the time tick by being like, no, I don't want it to end. Um, so we were gonna switch over and just sort of some smaller groups. We're gonna do the breakout room thing, um, which will happen. Uh, so if you need to take off and, and carry on with your day, then thanks for joining us. And if you want to stick around, that would be great. It's always nice to be able to process, especially when it's been such a great conversation and we can kind of like continue to tease things out. Um, Erica is going to sort everybody into breakout rooms. I'm going to give you a little bit of a prompt. I mean, there was so much that I think we can all take from this, but um, here's one just to kind of start. A lot of us have worked sort of adjacent to uh, zoos and aquariums. If you have, what's some element of like technical or creative consideration that was something that you had to take into, into consideration that you really didn't anticipate? So um, take that and see where that takes you in your room. Awesome, if everyone's ready, I'll go ahead and push everyone to their rooms. Um, there are a couple rooms that only have a few people. Um, but let us know if you're having any issue on your end and we'll make sure to push you somewhere else. You can just come back out to this main space. All right, give me one second. All right, we'll see you all soon.
Am I staying in the lobby with you, Erica? You are, unless you want to go somewhere. Mm-mm, I gotta go to the bathroom. I'll be back. <laughs> Thank you so much for doing this. I really, I'm so grateful for you. I'll oh no, you. thank you. I want to know who this other mystery Justin is. I know. Mystery. That was so freaking great. It was, it was really good. Oh, hold on, David Ion's in the other room. Hello. Oh, Denise, you're on mute. Hey. <laughs> there wasn't a, I think it was just, I only had one person in my room, so I don't know. Oh, no, okay. So, well, Me why too. don't why don't we just have a conversation here then well that sounds great how are you <laughs> how are you well, and we have lacy here with us too lacy can you tell me the prompt again oh yeah it was just if you've been doing any work with zoos or aquariums what are like conservation aspects or technical things that you had to take into consideration so i've been the project that i'm working on now is around tanks and as we were choosing background music there was like you've got to make sure it doesn't have too much bass and i was like i never even thought about that bass would interfere with that. There's just so many, so many things that go into like responsible, amazing work like all our panelists are doing. I think what, or anything else. Yeah, I think what was interesting was just what the panelists had said about, um, you know, conservation. Hi. Hi, Erin. I'm the only one in my room, and I just saw the little button for leave room. So I didn't know if you want to push me somewhere else or if I should just. No, come on back out to the main space. I think the problem is the second we hit the breakout rooms, a bunch of people dropped off, oh. <laughs> okay. um, which is really awful because then a bunch of people came back into the main space saying, I'm the only one in my room. Okay. So, um, Perfect. You might see what happens. I might close all the rooms and bring everyone back out and redo the rooms again. <laughs> All right, I'll see you. So I just want to share this interesting experience that I had with our project. And um, now it's touring in China. And then we actually uh, uh, located that in front in the, in the plaza that's outside of the Penda Breeding Research Center in Chengdu. So remember, um, I think the panel was talking about how, um, you know, there's a, there's a big effort in China that's about how to breed panda, how to protect them, how to uh, just do, do a lot of great things for, for this species. And I think this is really interesting that, you know, we've decided to use that opportunity um, to kind of like bringing a, a kind of a dinosaur IP project that is connected to because like these are animals that no longer exist, but here is an animal that we 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 still have, and and how do we make sure that we we can always be friends with them uh, in terms of you know when I'm talking about panda uh, at the end of it, but okay so so yeah I never thought about this really like how I, I unfortunately I, I wish I I have worked with animals and zoos and conservation as well but I haven't, but this is like the closest thing I had that's related to um, the great things that, you know, the panel and everybody who's shared has been doing. That's good stuff. That's it. <laughs> that's good stuff. I have a question for Aaron, who's now in our room. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> So did, um, what inspired you for the, for the experience, you know, for the, it's a Thea award. That's awesome. So is there anything that really struck you, you know, in the development of, of the experience? Um, uh, we were fortunate in that the aquarium, um, again, is located within Union Station, which is a large, large, it's 11 acre property. Um, already on property was the head house for the original train station, which is now a hotel. And the lobby of that hotel had the projection show that I mentioned, um, had also been awarded a Thea um, award when it came out a few years ago. So um, the design team, we ended up bringing back the same individuals to help us with this. Um, and the between the 
the grand lobby and the train, there were a couple of things. Um, we visited One World Tower. Mm, okay. Data ride where yeah. you're going up and it's showing you how um, the city is developing over time was a huge inspiration towards our train experience. Now, ours is a you know a very horizontal experience because um, <laughs> we're on a train. But how can we you know tie that in? How can we take you from 1894 when Union Station was built to today when the aquarium is open? Um, and so we did a little bit of that same thing and still honored um, St. Louis history by taking them from that time period and you get to see people in period dress all the way up to, you know, you get back, we open the doors and you're into the aquarium as it is now. Um, so that was kind of one of the bigger inspiration pieces for that part. Hi everybody, welcome back. We hope you had fun in your last breakout session. Um, I would like to give the stage to Justin and Lacey if you guys have anything to close out with before we say goodbye to everyone. What you got, Lacey? Uh, just again, heartfelt thanks to everybody for being here, to our panelists um, for a really cool discussion this morning. Please everyone find each other on LinkedIn and continue the magic there. Yeah, this was super fun. I really hope you guys can all join us next time and have a great rest of your day or night or afternoon. Thanks everyone. Bye everybody.